So thank you this morning for attending. We're talking about managing thrips in production nurseries. Here's a brief overview. So this project that funds the webinars also funds quite a lot of other things. The webinars are just a small component. We, we do diagnostics for every production nursery in Australia receives six free samples through Grow Help and we receive quite a lot of production nursery samples. Um, so you can send us sick plants or portions of sick plants, depending on the problem. We will run tests, look at it under the microscope, send you a report with test results and some recommendations. Um, we are also creating other fact sheets, best management plans that are available on the uh, Australian Plant Production Standards. So please raise your hand if you have ever been to or been to this website and had a look at some of the fact sheets or other things that are available. There's at least one a couple of hands going up. We were expecting more people to attend this webinar, by the way, but we, we have, we've only we don't have all that many. But so thank you for your uh, for your attendance and for uh, interacting. It's great. Okay, so you can get those uh, fact sheets. Use the search button. It works really well. If you search aphids or thrips or uh, Phytophthora, whatever, into the search button, the, those fact sheets and uh, various articles will come up. We're also doing some experimental work on investigating effective nursery hygiene on pest and disease incidents. So we'll have some of those results out next year. Okay, we'll get stuck into the rest, firstly on the biology and damage. Okay, so thrips is pretty small. Has anyone never seen a thrips? Raise your hand if you've never seen a thrips on a plant. Um, they're small cigar shaped. They tend to be yellow, orange, light brown, dark brown to black. Yellow and orange tends to be for the nymphs or the larvae, sorry. The darker colors tend to be the adults. The adults have wings. Larvae in the immature stages do not have wings. There are four different types of stages. The egg, two larval stages, two pupil stages, a pre-pupa and a pupa, and then the adult stage. Eggs are laid into or onto the plant tissue, and then the you know, larvae hatch out of those eggs. They start feeding. The, pupae, the pupation occurs either on the plant or in the soil. Pupae don't feed. And then the adults, again, they're on the plant running around feeding. And most species have males and females, but some species don't have males. The life cycle, we're talking about a lot of species of thrips in general, that the life cycle can take two to three weeks under favorable conditions and adults can live two to six weeks ish. Um, there'll be variation in that because we, there are, are a lot of different species of thrips, even though Western flower thrips tends to be one that is more well known and is a, a one of the larger problems. So females can lay 80 to 300 eggs. Uh, there's some pathogeneticis, which means some asexual reproduction or female only or there's various different types of pathogenesis. Pathogenesis. <sighs> can't say the word right now. You can read it there. Um, and some species have very high levels of pesticide resistance, mainly Western flower thrips and onion thrips. Okay, so you can see the pupae here, they sort of look, the larvae, the yellow, sometimes orange, they have legs, they'll walk around, whereas the pupae, you can see these little wing buds and they tend not to be very active. If they can sort of wiggle a little bit and sometimes I think they can actually walk, but they're pretty slow and they don't do a lot. John took these amazing photos uh, a couple of years back. This is on a French bean where you've got an egg of physician site. He, he dissected out this egg. These eggs are tiny. And then of course, you know, at one point he managed to get this nymph. So that's how they look when they're first coming out. An egg, you're unlikely to be able to get 
to this in a nursery setting. It really is quite fiddly work doing that. Right, okay, so most thrips are plant feeders. So a feed on plants, damage a the plant, they're bad for nurseries. Some species are predators, and there are some species that are fungal feeders. So the predators, of course, are beneficial. Fungal feeders, probably neither here nor there. Some species will also feed on pollen. Pretend that's probably not their sole source of food, but they'll also feed on pollen sometimes. Thrips have sucking, rasping mouth parts. So if you imagine if they, there's their mouth parts, there's a couple of little knives um, and they go and destroy the plant cells with their little knives rubbing back and forth and then suck up the juice, the plant cell contents, um, and, and that's how they feed. Collectively, so thrips can feed on anything above the ground, really, so stems, leaves, growing tips, flowers, you name it. Individual species are more like, some species are more likely to be found on certain areas of the plants, whether that's just on leaves or just on mature leaves, just on expanding leaves or just in the growing tip or just in flowers. And some species will be present just about anywhere. So there's a bit of variation. They damage the plants with those mouth parts. The damage to the cells, if it's on uh, immature leaves that are expanding or just in the process of expanding, that damage as that leaf expands, the leaf can't expand properly or the bud can't expand properly until you get that deformation or corky uh, or cur curled up leaves. That's how it happens because the leaf or the plant tissue can't expand properly. Feeding on mature leaves tends not to be as damaging. It can cause silvery brownish patches, similar to, to here in the bottom right hand, you see that corkiness uh, and up on the Indian patients in the top picture, you can see uh, more of that brown, sort of corky, raspy, like, um, symptom. And you can get that same sort of a symptom, that corky look on stems, fruit as they expand and, and leaves. Sometimes you will see fe fecal droplets or droppings and for some species they'll be black, others it will be uh, slightly different. You'll see some of those fecal droplets in photos as we go through the webinar. For some leaves, plants where there's really long leaves, so yucca or santaveria or some grasses, if there's strips feeding at the base of the plant, that tends to be where they'd be, at the base of the plant. And you can just barely see the little black mark there at the base of the leaf. That is the thrips and all this sort of chlorotic, blotchy, that's where the, the thrips have fed as it, the leaf has expanded. It hasn't deformed the leaf, but it has made this damage. And this, similarly in the sense of area, there's that corky, you can see the corky symptom. And also there's a, a little bit of a deformation or a waste like uh, symptom where it's not expanded properly. And so it's a little bit narrower in, in those areas. Some species can produce some cupping or galling. This is the ficus thrips and present in warmer areas of the country. Uh, some people probably have seen that. It's a very large thrips. I mean, like I think they're over a centimeter-ish. Uh, those, those very large black thrips with the tubular last segment, they're not as often pests, but um, sometimes they are. All right. So that's we're going to go on to monitoring and identification. Yellow sticky traps. Who has a yellow sticky trap that they use in their nursery? Just raise your hand if you could, please. And, and thank you for those few extra people that have attended. That's great. If you have, okay, thank you. A few people using silky traps. Who has yellow sticky traps that look like 
this one here, totally covered in insects. Yeah, one, thank you for your honesty. Unfortunately, yellow sticky traps, these small yellow sticky traps, they are for monitoring purposes. They're really not a mass trapping tool. So we don't recommend having this happen. What you want is a trap that's relatively empty because it's a monitoring tool so that you can count the number of insects that are present and have an idea of whether the populations are going up or going down. So depending on the number of insects that you're catching on your trap, you might go, okay, maybe you'll regularly count the insects in one row or one column and you'll get an idea of insects over time and you'll be able, and you, if depending on the number of insects, you change it more or less regularly. So in spring, as we're coming to spring and summer, you may need to change it more regularly than in the cooler months. Large rolls of sticky trap, as in this, in this picture down below, they are for mass trapping. You can get, let them get dirty because you're not really counting on these ones. You're, they're for mass trapping and you can also purchase pheromone lures for Western flower thrips. They're available through Bugs for Bugs. Perhaps other companies I'm not aware of, but they're definitely available through Bugs from, for Bugs. Um, you can put those on your sticky traps and you hopefully will get a better trap catch. When I say plant beating to monitor for thrips and other insects, does anybody, who knows what I'm talking about when plant beating? Raise your hand, please. Get one, two, three, four, cool. Most people do, uh, some do not. So uh, the next slide will have a picture, but basically you're hitting the plant against the plate or bowl or um, laminated paper. You're hitting the plant against your, your bowl, not the foliage against, sorry, foliage against the bowl, not the bowl against the foliage. You'll knock your insects off. It doesn't work very well. And you'll detect a lot of different pests and beneficial species, including thrips, adults, and larvae. And you can become quite proficient and at telling, at determining, observing of the shape of a thrips. You won't know what species it is, but you'll know that you've got thrips there. You can look with a hand lens. It's always a good idea if you find something with your plant beating. Have a look with a hand lens, confirm where they are on the plant, see, see what's going on. Microscopes are also help, helpful if you are doing quality assurance, looking at the growing tips, looking at, uh, let's say, your mother stock plants. Are there thrips? Are there other pests in the growing tips? And then sentinel plants can also be used. If you know of a particular variety that you're growing that is very susceptible, gets damage early, you may choose to grow a smaller a number of these as an early indicator. Right, okay, the thrip season has started. I'll get rid of those plants and, and really get stuck into um, to monitoring and managing thrips everywhere else. Does anybody use a sentinel plant, whether it's one that they throw out or then continue to grow? Raise your hand. Nobody? Okay, well, it is, a, it is a, an option that is available that you can keep in mind if, um, if that works for you. Right, now, in terms of identifying thrips, a species level identification can be really valuable under certain circumstances. Not necessarily necessary all of the time, although what entomologists wouldn't say that knowing the species isn't a good thing. It can be quite valuable for you when you're getting regular, consistent damage. So what is causing it? Are my, my management actions not working because I've identified it poorly and its biology is just not right for my management? When your control measures aren't successful or when you're getting virus symptoms, quite valuable, particularly when you start having virus symptoms. And we'll go talk about that more soon. Identifications can be achieved by slide mounting your thrips. And I really don't expect you to be, I have to do that. Slide mounting and identifying thrips, I find that difficult myself. John's better at it than I am, but 
unless you're doing it quite regularly, it's not all that easy. And sometimes you can also sequence thrips, so extract the DNA, put them in a tube, send them off for sequencing, and you can get a result back that way. It's a specialist activity, as I've said, and sometimes you actually have to do both molecular and slide mounting techniques. And I've added this um, link to it, this image from a paper. This is Franklinella schultzii, so tomato thrips. The research that they've done, they've done at University of Queensland has shown that there are actually three species that are included in the name Franklinella schultzii. In this case, it's correlated well to the color. So you've got your yellow version of schultzii, your brown version of schultzii, and your black version of schultzii. And they don't interbreed and they have differences in their biology, even though they're on sometimes the same host plants that you can you can see in cotton. Um, and this is this all this writing is a phylogenetic tree. And basically you can see the group here is the yellow group. And they are more closely related to each other than down here with this other group. And the this group is is a distinct group genetically compared to this the black group down here. That's really the nutshell of what that says. Don't worry about the individual text. What I'm saying is the comp it's complicated. Identifying thrips is complicated. Sometimes it's enough to know it's a thrips. Sometimes knowing the species is helpful. How many species of thrips are on the photo? Oh, we're going to love this. Guess what? Come on. Come on. John, would you like to tell, talk about this one? Yeah, these thrips are actually collected from bean plants, so in the flowers predominantly. Um, so that all thrips that actually feed in bean flowers uh, at various stages during the year. They don't all occur at once, but they occur in, sometime during the growing season. So, and as you can, like one of Andrew's previous slides about Franklin and Ella Schultzii, I actually found the brown one down here around Gatton. So, um, they do look very similar, some of them. And as Andrew said, trying to identify them even just with colour can be very difficult. Because to me, if I saw that slide, I would think there's at least two different types of thrips. But yeah. yeah maybe maybe six, three. Six when I looked, at, I looked at this thrips here and I went, oh, that's got to be a, a thrips to bassi, uh, onion thrips, and I was wrong. And um, but yeah, It's very anyway. confusing. Yep. What is helpful, is this and this if you have a microscope or a very good hand lens or good eyes with the hand lens you can potentially see if your thrips are franklinella thrips as in from the genus franklinella franklinella has western flower thrips tomato thrips and other types of thrips so if you see these two large hairs at the front corner and the back corner on both sides you can be 99% confident that you're dealing with a franklinella thrips. So if, particularly if it looks roughly like this, and obviously this is the yellow franklinella schultzi, then it gets black. And there are franklinellas that are in the range of pale to black. Um, okay. So if you see that, that combination on that pronotum, you can see them here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You can be pretty confident you're dealing with franklinella. Probably can't go any further than that. So anybody that you talk to that goes, oh yeah, that's a that's an onion thrip to that one, and that's and they haven't sent them off to be identified, don't listen to them. And you can blame me. I, I can take the blame. Happy. All right. So some more picture of thrips. Quite briefly, this is the the genus thrips. They only have two hairs back here. They don't have the tears up the front. Um, and there are many species, many ge genera 
that don't have that, that just have those two large hairs on that pronotum. Okay, and then another common species that we often get samples of is greenhouse thrips. It's fairly distinctive in its coloration, just the way it has the blackish, a black head and a couple of thorax, th thoracic segments, um, or head and thorax, and then um, yeah, paler abdomen, whitish wings, except at the base. But there are species that look quite similar and so it is possible to get it wrong. So just be aware sometimes colour is important, sometimes it can be misleading. Okay that's it for the first section. Do we have questions? Uh, I've got one for you Andrew. Um, haven't got any come up from the present uh, attendees yet but <clears throat> how many pest species do you think are actually present in nurse reproduction areas? It's de definitely at least, I don't know, 30, 50, maybe, maybe even 100. That would be pushing it out um, yep. just because the production nursery industry grows so many plants. So a lot of thrips and trying to differentiate each individual one is going to be a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> and there are going to be some more photos of different species of thrips and you'll look at them and go, wow, that looks almost exactly the same as the Western flower thrips type of thrips, but they weren't. Well, um, actually, that probably leads on to another one I'm just thinking of. Mm -hmm. Are there any thrips that are host specific? I think there are. Well, definitely there are. Like the yucca thrips, we have the photo of that. That's pretty specific to yucca. The ficus thrips, it's specific to ficus. Um, there are. Things like your Franklin yellow, Schultz eye, Occidentalis, your onion thrips, they have a pretty wide host range, is my understanding. Do you, yep. What do you think? I agree. Um, I only know a few specific, like you just said, your uh, ficus thrip. Um, yeah. We've only ever seen that on on figs. So. Yeah. And, and certainly the Western flower thrip and onion thrips are got a very wide host host range. Right. So. All right. Viruses. All right, there are uh, five Tosper viruses that are vectored by thrips that we have sometimes received in production nursery samples. Mainly it's tomato spotted wilt. It is by far the most important Tosper virus in Australia. Impatient's necrotic spot is a relatively recent introduction. It is has limited introduction a limited distribution in isolated areas in New South Wales and Victoria, but it could be, it could be a problem in the future. Capsicum chlorosis and iris spot, yellow spot, they're less important. Capsicum chlorosis may well be important in certain instances up in North Queensland. And then this pteristylus blotch virus that is a relatively recent um, description, detection um, of a native orchid having a TOSPA virus. Okay. For viruses, once a plant is infected, you can't cure it. Symptoms can vary depending on the host plant and the and the virus. And Sometimes you'll get chlorotic or necrotic ring spots. So this down here, this is actually a necrotic ring spot. Um, sometimes you just get your yellow blotches or mottling. Sometimes you'll get distorted leaves and fruit or you'll get wilt. And keep in mind that tomato spotted wilt and impatience necrotic spot are very similar. They have a similar host range. They have very similar symptoms. And sometimes we've had impatience sent in and I've looked at the symptoms and gone, uh-oh, We've got impatience necrotic spot, but it ended up being tomato spot of wilt. There are only a few species of thrips that we know of that transmit Tosper viruses, and the main one is Western flower thrips. Tomato thrips can transmit most Tosper viruses, but maybe less efficient, and some of the different species seem to have less, more or less efficiency than others. Um, melon thrips can 
back to some panini trips as well. Different populations, different species seem to have different abilities to vector viruses, but Western flower thrips is the worst and seems to be uh, quite efficient at vectoring tospoviruses. Tospoviruses are spread by thrips, by cutting, and that's pretty much it. They're not spread by pruning equipment or any other type of equipment. They're not spread by touching or rubbing or your clothing. They're not spread by seed. They're not spread in decaying crop residues in the soil. So in that sense, I mean, no virus is good, but there are fewer ways of tospoviruses spreading. And uh, thrips tend to spread by wind. Um, so in the wind, and I'm not actually aware of them spreading on other insects, but it's possible that very small larvae would potentially jump onto another insect and go to another area. And they're really not very strong uh, flyers. I meant to talk about the spread of thrips earlier, but we'll do it now because we're talking about spread. Someone asked in an email just prior to the webinar about whether the um, thrips have any patterns in terms of when they fly during the day. And I did do a quick search and I couldn't find any real patterns. One paper said that there was no pattern at all, no significant difference. They could, they could fly any time of the day. Another paper said that in one year, well, the, the peak time was at 10 a.m. and another year it was at 1 p.m. To me, that's for Western flower thrips. I should say that. Western flower thrips I was looking at. Maybe there are some species of thrips that fly at particular times of day. But thrips are very poor flyers. They, they do not fly very strongly. They've just got those hairs as wings pretty much. And they pretty much have to float on the wind. One thing that was said in the papers that I read is that they only, Western flower thrips only really flew when it warmed up and was above about 10, 15 degrees. So above about 15 degrees, if it's below about 15 degrees, they're less likely to fly. All right, we'll move along. Tospovirus, the tospovirus life cycle is a little bit complicated. Early instar, early instar larvae have to acquire the virus and they feed for about 30 minutes and they get it. Once they've got it, they'll have it for the rest of their life. But if they don't have it, they don't get it as a first instar nymph or very early as a second instar nymph, they can't transmit the virus later in life. What happens is the virus incubates in the, the thrips, it moves to different parts of the insect, it reproduces, and then after the five or six days of, whatever, of incubating, that individual can transmit the virus. And it can transmit it if, after about five minutes of feeding, it can transmit it to that healthy plant and the, the plant's got it then. Adults and late second instar nymphs that feed on a plant, they, they acquire the virus, but they can't vector the virus. Even if they feed on a healthy plant afterwards, they just, they don't, somehow it doesn't move around in the insect in the same way as it does for the very early instars. Um, we might just expand on the one with the diurnal activity that you're talking about and, and how they spread, yep. Andrew, because we did have a yep. question about um, what's a diurnal activity so that growers can avoid spraying insecticides right. when they're actively flying. And I know you said that they, they're not very good flyers, so they've spread more by the wind. So is there anything else that you want to add to that? I guess from that perspective, if you have a choice to spray when it's cool, then you'll be more likely to have the adults on the plant. Like if it's less than 15 degrees, they're not likely to be flying. They're less likely to be flying. And one last question, what would you regard as the risk period or season for thrips? Okay, can you answer that one, please, John? You've you've done more work. <laughs> um, well, we're coming into spring. Um, a lot of insects, as that or 
can be very seasonal. Um, I know bean blossom thrips are more a late summer autumn pest. Western flower thrips, I've seen large numbers during spring, early summer. It's getting to know the biology of the actual thrips uh, species that you are dealing with. So it all comes down to proper identification of your thrips, knowing the exact species, and then just doing some research on when it is going to be most likely there, what temperatures it prefers. Yeah, it's there's no specific question about thrips in general. You just have to take them species at a time as to know when they're going to be more of an issue. Yeah, you, get, you are going to get different ones at different times of the year. Cultural practices were onto management. Firstly, monitor your crops regularly. If you've heard John and I at a workshop in previous years or in another, monitor, another webinar, we're constantly talking about monitoring. It's really important for you to understand patterns, let's say seasonal patterns um, in your crop and patterns across different host plants. Then you can get to understand what's high risk in what season, in what host plants, what's high value, and you can assign greater monitoring effort to the crops that have the higher risk. And mother stock plants. Mother stock plants are always important to monitor because particularly leading up to when you're about to, when you're going to take cuttings, make sure that if thrips are a problem on that host plant or some other pest, look at them carefully and make sure that they are well managed so that you don't propagate a pest as well as your plant. Monitoring coming stock, return stock as necessary. Um, I hope that some of you do that. Manage your weeds. I put this in bold because it's such an important one to do from the virus perspective as well as the pest. So pests, they can go onto your weed, they can put on your top of they can transmit the, the virus to the weed. Sometimes those weeds are asymptomatic. In other words, they will never look like they've got a, a symptom, but they will have the, the virus present. So that can act as a reservoir, same as with the pests. And while they can also have predators on those weeds, I would recommend in you know, a nursery setting, get rid of your weeds have banker or garden plants specifically for managing, um, um, uh, for keeping predators, and we'll talk about that more soon. The never propagate from mother stock plants infested with pests or diseases. And when you are managing, if you're having a pest outbreak, whether it's thrips or perhaps another pest or disease, in fact, it's worth managing your consignments so that the young plants aren't next to an older crop. Because the older crop, which is more likely to have the pest or the disease, and then it's easier to jump a smaller distance and get stuck into your smaller crop. So for this uh, photograph here on the next slide, if this nursery was dealing with a a pest outbreak, and I'm not, and I, they weren't at the time. It's just a nice photo of, of plants that are small and then plants that are larger and then plants that are even bigger. They're all right next to each other. So if you were dealing with a pest outbreak, these ones here would potentially be a source that could go into the smaller plants. So that's something to keep in mind that you can do. It's quite practical. Remove your unsaleable and highly infested stock. That's important for that same reason because it's a source of inoculum, a source of pests that can move into your crop to the, the healthy individuals. And when we're talking about remove them hygienically, bag them if there's a really large number into a, a covered bin of some sort, dispose in council waste if possible or remove them from your site. If you have to keep them on site, 
bury them. Don't put plants that have pests or diseases into a compost heap because as for the same reason, it will move from the plant back into the crop. Sometimes you can prune out lightly damaged foliage, bag it, seal that bag. You can stick that in the sun, kill the plants, uh, kill the kill the um the pest infested material. And again, remove plants with virus symptoms. If you're unsure if it's if you've got a virus, you're only suspicious, you go, oh it doesn't really look right. What do you think? And you send off a sample, just quarantine it. Keep it separate if you possibly can and then wait for the results to come back. Who has protected cropping uh, structures that have UV absorbing film netting or cladding? Just raise your hand if you know that you do. Um, yeah, we've got a, at least one. This is research that's been done over the, I'm not even sure what time frame, relatively recently. They've shown, a few people are raising their hands now, that's great. They've shown a distinct reduction in thrips numbers, as well as whitefly aphids, just by having this covering the crop. Be interested if you could, have, if you've done that, if you could share your experience, if you'd like to, around have you seen a reduction before and after using these UV absorbing claddings for your protected crop structures? That would be awesome. Furthermore, the research has shown that it can reduce the movement of Western flower thrips within your tunnel. Keeping your doors closed will also help. And if you possibly can, you can install fine mesh screens over vents. And you just have to be aware that you can potentially change the humidity in your, um, in your, your structure. So keep that in mind and make sure that you have sufficient ventilation. Okay, we're gonna to move to the next one. Keep your growing area clean for all sorts of reasons. Thrips are just one of them. Disinfest your benches, your floors, your equipment between your crop cycles. Don't let the organic matter, weeds, algae uh, build up in your growing area. That can be a source of all sorts of diseases as well as pests, fungus gnats, thrips, pupae if they've gone off. Um, and to pupate in the soil or growing media. To decontaminate your benches and your, your, your floors, you will have reductions in pests as a result. And, and it's just a nicer place to work as well. Rip spread on people. So if you are walking through a, a, an area that has thrips, you walk, you brush up against the plant, you're touching the plants, they will crawl on you and you won't even necessarily know. Some people can be more sensitive and maybe you'll find, you'll, you'll get your skin crawling type feeling. Others, you'll be on your clothing, you won't, you won't see them at all. If you then move to an area that doesn't have many thrips, you can spread them to those plants. So it's recommended if you know you've got an, an, an infestation, move from your clean areas to your infested or, or your hotspots and go to those hotspots at the end of the day if you possibly can. For some, um, some plants are more resistant just naturally or tolerant to pests, whether that's because they don't show damage or because the thrips doesn't survive as well, it, it can vary. So record, monitor as we've said and use that information to grow plants that are more resistant or tolerant compared to the ones that are more susceptible. All right, lastly, biological and chemical control. There are about 10 predators that are commercially available that can feed on thrips on the foliage as well as other predators are in the soil growing media. There's also the pheromone lure for Western flower thrips, as we've said, there are broad spectrum products that have high residuality and kill basically everything or almost everything. And there are low risk products in terms of pesticides that have a reduced impact on your predators. 
Okay, so the predators first. Predators, so biological control is most effective when you do it early. When you release your predators proactively, so you have your monitoring, you have your knowledge of what happens on your nursery, start releasing just before the high risk period so you can get your predators to build up in numbers and keep the thrips under control throughout the season before significant damage has occurred. As soon as you have high numbers of thrips, it's going to become very difficult to use fire control to be effective. So release fortnightly, weekly, maybe monthly is all you need, depending on the pest, the pest risk, the value of the crop, the likelihood of damage, so on and so forth. It's worth being aware that the cost of fire control agents have actually decreased a lot. I remember maybe 10 years ago, you buy a tube of vermiculite with you know 10,000 predators and it would be like $100. Now, the same product, they've improved their efficiency in, in, re in rearing, mass rearing these predators. And sometimes it's down around 25 or $25 or less for the same amount of predators. So that means that even for small areas, it can be quite effective. And as, as I said, we've got small and large packs. Um, the foliar predators that you would be looking to purchase to manage thrips are these ones here. Cucumerus, which is a predatory mite. It feeds on not just thrips, but a range of other small insects, including oh, like spider mite eggs and various other small mites having a blanket this time on, on the moment. Um, Monterensis or Monty is similar. Aureus the pirate bug is very efficient with the uh, um, for, for feeding on thrips. Benefit of the pirate bug is that the adults can fly and so they'll move around to hotspots. There are also some slow release sachets available that both biological services and bugs for bugs now produce. And basically what that is, is a small bag that is specifically designed to have the predators continually sort of uh, emerge or exit the bag over a period of two to three weeks. So that's valuable. I can, there's definite benefits in doing that. Keep in mind that the bags, the sachets can be a little bit time consuming to a uh, place in the field. Um, so just, that's something that you need to keep in mind when you're considering it. There are also a couple of predators for greenhouse thrips. So the cucumerus, monte and aureus, they tend to be ones that will feed on a lot of different species of thrips, but they tend not to be as good for greenhouse thrips. And greenhouse thrips is definitely a species which can be a problem in the nursery industry. And so there are two species you can potentially purchase for greenhouse thrips specifically. The soil predators are basically the same as for fungus gnats. Hypoaspis, the killer mite, they're very similar. The locia, which is a predatory beetle and the insect eating nematodes. And what I'd suggest is that these soil predators are probably only going to be worth using against thrips in areas where you would also be releasing them against fungus gnats. So in your propagation, I'd be surprised if you, you don't, I wouldn't rely on soil predators for managing thrips in relatively large pots because I, there is there's so much foliage, you probably you need to be having it as just a component in the control if you were going to be using them in that way. Biological control is best done between about 10 and 30 degrees, optimally about fit between about 15 and 25. Some species will survive lower temperatures, some species higher temperatures. So it's worth talking to your biological control agent producer about your specific needs and the conditions at your nursery, what you've sprayed recently, if anything, your host plants, 
before you start releasing for the first time. Most plant species are suitable for use for using biological control, but there are some plants where predators just don't work. Tomatoes, some species aren't able to cope with the hairs. Um, and it is worth understanding that broad spectrum pesticides will kill most predators and will have a relatively long residual. Sometimes three is a relatively short, long residual, whereas 12 or even six, 12 weeks or six months can sometimes occur. Low risk products still may have a detrimental impact. And just take note that these thrips here are predatory thrips. You may see thrips that are black and white. Um, most likely that's from one family of thrips that are predators. Anyway, the low risk insecticides, they, have, they may cause your predators to survive for a shorter period of time or lay fewer eggs or kill fewer predators or just be less energetic and have a, a lower ability to survive. Predators in the growing media may have may be more buffered, so you, the foliar of pesticides may not affect them as much. But as I said, I wouldn't rely on soil predators to manage thrips. Also, keep in mind that products applied in one area of the nursery will move through the nursery in irrigation water, particularly where you where, where you're recycling and Products can spread. In protected cropping in particular, it can be, have a longer residual just because it's contained and the properties in the, in the protected cropping structure. That's, that's just what happens. You have a longer residual time. There's a fact sheet on managing predators in production nurseries that goes into more details. That's just sort of a quick overview. So the summary of biocontrol is to release early, avoid using pesticides wherever you can. If you have to use a pesticide, use low risk products. Remove the highly infested plants first so that you can lower the population and contact your biocontrol producer. If you have any questions, they would like to see you ask questions and get it right as opposed to have you fail. All right, and, the, and those are the three main producers that have thrips predators. We're getting close to the end. On chemical control, this is a list of the broad spectrum products. And this webinar will be made available. I'll send a link afterwards to the playlist where it will be made, on, made available online. The 1A, 1B, 3A, they tend to have quite long residuals, very long in fact, and some of these products are pretty nasty, particularly the, the 2As and the, and the one group one products. The group 4A products, the, the neonicotinoids, and some retail outlets will not accept plants that have had those products applied, so keep that in mind. C is for contact, S is for systemic. The lower risk products, um, they'll have lower residual activities, so they'll decrease in the area. Obviously, they'll be in the area for a shorter period of time. There are still contact and translamina or um, systemic products, the so translamina being that if you spray it to the top of the leaf, it'll go through to the bottom or vice versa. And I know that there was an immature growth regulator in there, but now I'm not seeing where it is in the column. So I'm wondering if it was... As a director, it does act as a growth regulator too, Andrew. Nice. And was it flonic... Flon I can't even say it, it right now. Yeah, flonica <laughs> flonicamide. <laughs> yeah, all right. So... Um, where a product is an immature growth regulator, you've got to apply it to the immature stages. I know it sounds obvious, but if you apply this product and you think it's going to kill your adults, it might knock them around a little bit, but it's going to have a lower effect on the adults than it is for the very small larvae. 
pesticide resistance, and I see we're just getting on to 11 o'clock, so we'll, we'll go through this. We're almost done. Pesticide resistance has been detected in Australia for Western flower thrips against a range of different products. Again, your broad spectrum products, as well as some of the low risk products. Same with onion thrips has had some resistance reported. The thing to keep in mind is this information is relatively old in that the work, the research completed was when Western flower thrips um, first came into Australia and it was a massive pest um, for the first time. And now there's less research being done. So we could well have greater levels of pesticide resistance or conversely, maybe there's less if we're lucky. And there's evidence of resistance to other products overseas. So it's worth keeping in mind that pesticide resistance is a real problem. And if you overuse a product, any one product, it can be uh, ineffective. The product becomes ineffective. So don't rely on pesticides. Use Always use as many cultural practices as possible. To reduce pesticide resistance, calibrate, calibrate your equipment regularly. Make sure your nozzles are right and they're not worn out. Have them be clean. Ensure that the correct amount of product goes onto the crop. Apply under your suitable weather conditions and make sure you get good coverage. Because if you don't have good coverage in a really thick plant, if you don't get underneath, if underneath the leaves, if that's where the thrips are, then you're not going to do so well. And apply products that are appropriate. So if you've got a product, uh, a thrips that's on the inside of a leaf or on the underside of a leaf and it's really hard to penetrate, you may need to use a, a translaminar or a systemic product. To reduce resistance further, always use the label resistance management, management strategy. So if there is a resistance manage, management strategy on the label, use it. But if there isn't a, a, a strategy on the label, this is the general guideline. Apply three sprays of the same product consecutively. Three to five days apart, if you are above 20 degrees, or six to 12 days apart, less than 20 degrees. This is, has been specifically designed for Western flower thrips um, to take into account the, the change in the length of the life cycle at different temperatures. Allow at least a two or three week break. And then if you need to, do the same thing, but with a product from a different mode of action group. If you can't wait two to three weeks because your numbers have increased, excuse me, it probably means one of three things. One, you potentially have insecticide resistance. Two, you may have sprayed inappropriately. Three, you may need to increase your hygiene and cultural practices. There is no amount of predator or pesticide applications that will make up for having good hygiene and cultural practices in a nursery. So in summary, keep your growing area clean, use as many cultural practices as you can to prevent thrips, use predators if you possibly can, start using them, build them into your uh, into the way you do things at your nursery if you possibly can. Avoid using broad spectrum products, use low risk pesticides if pesticides have to be used. And when you are using those products, take actions to minimize pesticide resistance. What are the treatment thresholds for thrips? <laughs> so when would you decide to take action to treat either biological or chemical um, can plants be monitored for damage first? Also, can plants develop tolerance with time or maturity? You want to answer yes. that one? <laughs> um, <laughs> monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. So thresholds are useful sometimes. Normally, they are developed with respect to a specific pest in a geographic region on a particular host plant. So 
I haven't put any thresholds in there because one, we're talking about lots of pests, we're talking about lots of host plants, and we're talking about lots of geographic regions. So I tended to think that putting any thresholds in would be misleading and potentially wrong and would potentially lead you astray. So monitor your crop, find out what is what number of thrips. So if you if you look back at some, I'm going to go back uh, some of these ones here in the spath film, um, that the circle there that's a thrips. And you could see really small numbers of thrips were causing this wonky growth. And the same, it was the same species that Kitano for thrips um, on the anthurium, as well as the spathulum at this nursery. So small numbers was causing a large amount of damage. So for, to me, that means that, and, and for these crops, you know, if it looks like that, it's less saleable. I mean, who wants to buy a plant like that compared to one that's healthy? No, I wouldn't choose to buy that plant compared to one that looks pristine. So your threshold is lower. The exact I, number? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and I guess counter to that too is I work in vegetable crops. Western mm. flower thrips are considered a major pest in vegetable crops. But in some of the work that I was doing, I may have been getting up to seven thrips per flower, but getting very little damage. Whereas mm. where with bean blossom thrips, you only need one thrip per flower. Rip, what did you, you just say, John? Thrips. Yeah, one thrips <laughs> per flower. <laughs> to give you a large amount of damage. So it's very relative if you need, to, that's why you need to know exactly what thrips species you have and monitoring as Andrew has pointed out is really vital. So you can track how many thrips are causing the types of damage that you're seeing and they work accordingly. And we do have a couple of others that have come up. Let me just get them up here. Um, can I see a list of chemical controls again? So pull up that slide. Um, yeah. And does the yellow sticky roll need to be put at plant level or can it be put below where plants are on the bench? Mm. I guess the rule of thumb is having the sticky traps at plant height mm. rather than mm. too low in the crop. Mm. Well, I might get to my gut feeling too. I would say it's better to be higher than it is lower, but you could test it. I mean, if you put some traps below and some traps above and then count them after a week and you could see what, what the difference is in your growing environment. And Sabine, yes, you can collect samples of thrips and send them in for identification. Andrew, do you offer that? as a service, as part of your project? We can sequence them. We don't, I mean, I could have a go to, I'm not very good at slide mounting though, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> we'd probably sequence them. Um, it yeah. takes less time to stick them in a tube. And my understanding is you, you get pretty good results with strips. And I guess ideally, if you are looking at sending thrips into whoever, whether it's um, your local departmental um, diagnostic lab, the the fresher the better. But if there are issues with biosecurity issues, then putting them into a small bottle with ethanol uh, yeah. would be better than, than nothing at all. That does flush them out of the flowers as well. So you end up having a heap of thrips at the bottom of the bottle. Um, or jar, vial, whatever, making yep. it easier for the diagnostician to um, extract. There so is yes, another point. Yep. yep, sorry. Sorry, John. No, you go ahead. No, I was just saying it just makes it easier. And most labs should be able to identify them to some level of accuracy. Yeah. The other important thing is to send as many as you can within reason. Sometimes 
particularly for let's say western flower thrips and tomato thrips you get multiple species present so we would be sending off multiple species for sequencing to make sure that you're dealing with one species and and not more than one that seems to be about it well thanks everyone for being part of today 